So if you don't mind, I'm going to stand down here. I think, I think I'm tall enough. I don't need, I don't need that, that little stage. Um, so look, we're going to spend the next 20, 25 minutes um, really just talking about Onafrique, uh, formerly MFS Africa, and um, with a specific sort of emphasis on our journey in terms of helping drive financial inclusion, financial adoption. And um, let me start from the very beginning. This could be any phone number. This happens to be a phone number in DRC. And the genesis of Onafrique, if I take you back to 2010, was the notion that a phone number could actually hold a wallet, i.e. mobile money. I'm sure all of you have heard of mobile money. But back in 2010, this was revolutionary. And the whole idea was very few people on the African continent had the ability to own a bank account, to have you know, their own bank account. So how do you drive easy, cheap, accessible financial inclusion? And this was one of the ideas. At that point, our founder and CEO was with MTN, and he was actually building MTN's version one of mobile money. And he quickly realized that if mobile money is going to be as pervasive, as accessible, as attractive, and as impactful as MTN wanted it to be and everyone else wanted it to be, there needs to be a degree of interoperability. Domestically, i.e. if I have a mobile wallet, how do I interact with someone else's mobile wallet? But also cross-border. And it was on that basis almost 15 years ago that, at the time, MFS Africa was born, now on Afrique. And it was really born on a mission, a passion for trying to give access by making borders matter less. And really, the emphasis was quite simple, and the, the, sort of the, the, the mission behind it was quite simple, and that is, I want to make the ability to make a payment as easy as it is to dial that phone number. There used to be a time when dialing that phone number was a real ordeal. You had to figure out how do you dial the number, how do you find a phone that can dial long distance. Now we pick up any phone and we call, and we know, we take it for granted that that call is going to be patched through. We don't know how it's done, but we know it's going to get through. The idea was we want to make payments as easy as that by eradicating borders. And the whole idea was that if we can get mobile money, and of course the premise behind the foundation of Onafrique was mobile money will grow. And if mobile money will grow, if we're able to be the infrastructure layer, the interoperability, then we can help drive that financial inclusion and that financial growth. So 15 years later, what are we today? Here are just a few stats. 500 million mobile wallets are connected to our, our network. That's about, to put in perspective, that's about 75% of all mobile wallets on the African continent. Add to this about 200 million bank accounts. Um, we're across 40 African markets, and we continue to add markets as we go along powering about, give or take, 1,300 payment corridors. And we are a B2B player. So you will not see us offering wallets. You will not see us interfacing and engaging with the end user. But you will see our partners. And I'll come to who some of our partners are. But these are large financial institutions, banks, non-banks, mobile network operators, remittance companies, who all interface with the end user, but they use our infrastructure, our payments network, to drive cross-border payments in one way or another. On a, you can see, 300,000 merchants connected to our network. Um, we also operate card programs, and I'll come to that a bit later, 150 of them. We were the first fintech uh, on the African continent to be issued a, a visa uh, principal issuing uh, license. And we have offices, 13 global offices, 10 
on the continent. So what is it that we operate? It's a omnichannel, real-time, bidirectional payments network. So let's double click on some of those. Why omnichannel? Although the genesis of the network was mobile money, and ultimately one of the key differentiations we have is that connectivity to mobile money. However, we interface with agent networks, we interface with banks, so bank accounts, mobile wallets, cards, so it's that interoperability across and within multiple payment rails. Bidirectional, this was from the very start. We needed to ensure the network could both credit and debit, i.e. both disperse and collect. Why is that important? Because ultimately it drives different use cases. And it also allows flows to be netted off within and across the network. Real time, any transaction that's initiated on our network today, if you pick up, take Western Union, World Remit, any of our major partners, and you hit send on that app, within less than 30 seconds, that payment will be delivered, that payout will be delivered to the end recipient in any of those 40 markets in less than 30 seconds. And it was really important and this has been the case since the very beginning, it was really important that the network was real time. Because inherently, if we go back to 2010, many of the users, most of the users, there was not an inherent trust in the financial services environment at the time. So we needed to make sure that if someone was on their mobile wallet and hit send from Benin to Cote d'Ivoire, from Uganda to Kenya, from Malawi to Tanzania, that they could immediately pick up the phone and their brother and sister and mother would say, I have it, thank you. So from the very beginning, we said it needs to be real time. So what are the, sort of what does this look in practical terms? On the left hand side, you see the different, call it products or use cases, so obviously disbursement, I've touched on that. Collections, let me speak a little bit about collections. Although originally, a lot of our flows were either intra-Africa, right, from one African country to another, or north-south, London to Lagos, or you know, Washington DC to, to Accra. More and more, as e-commerce have grown, we've started to see the reverse. If you are a large global merchant and you truly want to access the masses, if you're reliant on someone having a debit card or a credit card to pay for those online services and goods, you're touching the top 1%, 2%, 3%. If you really want to go and approach the masses, you need to have an ability for people to pay using their mobile wallet. So the collections service is one that we see continued strong growth. And I touch here cards and treasury services. Obviously treasury services comes from the, from the sheer standpoint that we are matching flows. It's a bi-directional network in and out. We handle local currencies. We ensure that there's float in this payment network. Float is sort of the, the oil in the engine without the local currency in each of the market. We don't have the ability to pay out. So we manage that for many of our partners. And let me just pause a little bit on cards because this to many people is a bit of an outlier. But I think the premise on this is, although we don't necessarily believe that the physical cards are going to be as pervasive in some of our African markets as it is here, for example. We do, however, believe that the 16-digit card credential will be a critical aspect of being able 
to accept, and in some cases make, but predominantly accept payments. Because many of the big merchants are not necessarily going to change their interface. Netflix is not going to change their interface and say, I can now put in my M-Pesa mobile number. But if you can link that mobile wallet with a 16-digit card credential, suddenly you're opening up the entire e-commerce universe. So that's the reason why we have gone into and believe that cards, card infrastructure, and if you will, the foundations of card and card payments play such an important role in driving financial inclusion and financial access. I, um, I've touched a little bit before sort of who are our partners, and again, we are a B2B, an infrastructure utility player, if you will, and our partners is everything from banks to remittance companies, MTOs, MNOs, large corporate, other fintechs, enterprises, in some cases government and sort of NGOs and so forth, and generally speaking that have a need to either send a payment or payments onto the African continent, take money out, i.e. sending them out, or have some sort of intra-Africa payment needs. What are some of the use cases that we power? I mean, these are just sort of examples. It's the top one is someone needing to send a remittance, which I've touched on. Another one is a merchant needing to pay a, their you know, worker, a digi dig digital worker who is either doing some programming for them, is uh, driving a car, whatever it may be, and they, they have payment needs, and they don't necessarily want to open up a bank account in each and every one of those markets. This is as a corporate, and they want to use, have the ability to still pay, send payments. Um, another one here touched on is an international online marketplace. Pick any of your favorite e-commerce merchants who wants to access and get paid. And the final one here is you know, a small uh, business running their own shop and needing to get paid, particularly, as some of you may know, in many of the markets there is a very vibrant intra-Africa, particularly along the borders of many of our markets, where actually cash is still dominant, although mobile money is very much present. So by enabling the ability for someone with an M-Pesa wallet to pay to someone in Uganda, suddenly you're opening up not just the remittance use case, but actually the informal small b to b, if you will, or small b to p payment flows as well. And we think that is, that's part of what we do and part of how we drive accessibility and inclusion. What underpins sort of our network? Obviously, it's taken us 15 years to get to where we are now. And I would say the first 10 years were largely speaking focused on really driving the network, driving the technology, and subsequently overlaying that with the necessary services to run what is now a pan-African large-scale payments network. So we have a robust compliance and reporting layer. Now this is everything from what you would expect of any payments company, so real-time screening, transaction monitoring, but it goes further than that. It is the sort of the regulatory licenses, letters of no approvals that we have that underpin our ability to offer these services to partners. And even though many of our partners are regulated entities themselves, as I said, they're banks or they're remittance companies or they're MNOs who each have their own license and therefore have their own obligations, we also knew from the very beginning that if you want to be a trusted intermediary, a trusted payments network, we need to also ensure that we screen all transactions and that we have the necessary controls in place. So there's a robust compliance and reporting layer at that center in that hub. There's a funding and settlement. Ultimately, although we process a transaction in 30 seconds, 
clearly the physical money doesn't move in 30 seconds. As we know, although we run a real-time network, to actually get money from partners to us and so forth takes much longer than that. And we're still, in many ways, reliant on other financial infrastructures to do so. Um, although there's a real drive to sort of automate and to increase the efficiency in that settlement cycle, um, in many ways, there is still, someone is always out of pocket in this. So we run a fairly sophisticated sort of settlement network with all of our partners, which includes local bank accounts and local bank account relate or local bank relationships in all the markets so that we can actually facilitate the payout and facilitate the collections in each of those markets. Although we operate extensively on mobile money, we also deal a lot through people who have bank accounts, either to get paid into bank accounts or paid out, but ultimately the funds have to go somewhere. So either we owe someone because we've collected on their behalf, they owe us because we paid out on their behalf, and there's a whole, not only team, but technology that powers sort of that float, that funding, and that settlement layer. And finally, of course, that underpins all of this is APIs and messaging layer. And this is really the ability for any of our partners, whether it's their online banking platform, whether it's their app, whether it is purely through API to API connectivity, I corporate treasurer using it, um, our partners' ability to not only communicate with us, but also to retrieve and receive the necessary information that they need to reconcile their accounts, to ensure that they are uh, compliant with their KYC obligations and so forth. And that all comes through the API and messaging layer. And that brings me to the last slide, which is really just one that says, when we started this journey 15 years ago, the focus was really on how do we use mobile money as the backbone, which there was a hypothesis. And at the time, now, of course, everyone has heard of mobile money. Everyone has heard of M-Pesa and sort of the large. But back in 2010, that was not clear. And back in 2010, it was not a given that that was going to revolutionize financial services on the African continent. The premise was we believe that mobile money would be a catalyst for financial services and for financial inclusion. And we believe that that would give access. And on that basis, we have been on this journey and we're still on this journey. And um, we, uh, I think we will not stop until at least we've covered the entire African continent and then we might go elsewhere. So thank you very much.